Welcome to the Virtual CPA Success Show for creative agencies, the go-to resource for agency owners looking to scale their business. Join us every week to stay ahead of the curve and position your agency for future success. Hey there, listeners. On today's episode of the Virtual CPA Success Show, Jody Grun and I talked about all things RFPs and healthcare with Lauren Miners, the Director of Partnerships and Marketing at Reason One. We touched on some trends in the healthcare space, how to compete with an incumbent agency for new work, and what sort of feedback you should be asking for after your pitch. Also, be sure to stick around to the end of the show to hear Jody plan my next big road trip. We hope you all enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Virtual CPA Success Show. Um, I'm your host today, Joey Kinney, joined as always by Jody Grundin. Hi, Jody. How are you today? Oh, doing well, Joey. Thanks for uh, having me. Of course. We are joined today by Lauren Miners, the Director of Partnership and Marketing at Reason One, a digital agency. Um, I think you guys are all over the place, but you're based in South yeah, Carolina. Yeah, we're is that fully correct? remote. Uh, we have a hub in Charleston, South Carolina, which is where I am. And then we have uh, several team members who are also across the border up in Canada too. So we are, uh, we're all over the place. Yeah, we're international oh. as it were. <laughs> Well, as, as you and most of our audience probably know, we're big fans of the, the fully remote team and happy to hear you've got some international experience as well. Um, what are some things about your work at Reason One that um, you'd like to yeah, talk about Yeah, so um, just to set the stage, Reason One, we're, a, like we said, fully remote digital agency, and we serve primarily the healthcare industry. So that's healthcare uh, systems and hospitals. It's also associations that are associated with um, particular um, practice areas, and then also philanthropy. So the fundraising arm of hospital systems. Um, and yeah, I think mm -hmm. we, we wanted to dive into some, some tips and tricks or some, some universal truths around RFPs today, right? I think, I think that's a great place to start. And I've got a number of clients in the digital space and not in the digital space who are kind of they're feeling some more headwinds in the economy right now. Things in the pipeline haven't been as, I would say, fluid as they've been in the past. And we're, we're noticing that proposals are taking longer. There's more pushback back and forth on SOWs. What are some things that you guys are seeing in your space as you're working on the marketing arm of your company, trying to get either SOWs renewed or new projects? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we, we're experiencing that as well. And I feel like everybody else that I've talked to, regardless mm -hmm. of, like I said, we're in the healthcare space, but it doesn't, it seems to not really matter what vertical you're in right now is that everyone has kind of a slower pipeline. Um, and we have been responding to more RFPs than usual this year. Um, I'm not sure what that's, if that's like to some turnover in our own clientele and like what their processes are, or if that's just in mm -hmm. response to the market, everyone's hungry, everybody is out there trying to get to catch those leads. Um, so, so yeah, we've had a ton go out recently. And, um, and one thing we're seeing too, is a lot of clients that are, not going just right back with the incumbent. You know, we've been invited to a lot of dances mm -hmm. where the incumbents weren't part of the equation um, or were eliminated really quickly because they're looking for new blood. So that really kind of tells you that the RFP process is going to become, I think, more and more competitive, especially in our in our markets. Yep. Yeah, and just to kind of clarify, uh, Lauren, you deal with primarily I do, yeah, currently. Um, but in my career, I've done, I've been living in the RFP space for probably like 15 years or so. And, you know, it, there's just, there's things across industries that are universally true. So manufacturing, mm -hmm. K-12 health, um, higher ed, like it's all, it, all of these uh, issues that, that agencies are coming up against in other, in other businesses it's the same across the board. It's not necessarily unique to healthcare or unique to hospital systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just kind of curious with, in, in particular with the healthcare industry itself, you know, it's always evolving and stuff. So how, how are you making sure that your proposals are remaining, you know, relevant to up-to-date standards and, and advancements? Well, and so I think it's less than it's, it's less, you know, what's happening in the actual industry and more understanding the client and what they are up against. So um, in that sense, it is, okay. you know, what's what's the high level of hap of what's happening in the industry. Um, but but knowing 
how that affects the individual and the team that is seeking services and what they are responding to. So, you know, for instance, if they're putting out an RFP for a brand new website build, yeah, that's what they need at the end of the day. Um, but what they're really looking for is patient acquisition. What they're really looking for is conversion. Mm. And what they're really looking for is um, job security. So it's up to us to deliver that. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, at the end of the day, you're gonna get a website, but what are you really providing? And then how do you communicate that through the RFP process? It's a little bit of a counterintuitive way to look at it because you think like, oh, okay, like we can do this. Mm -hmm. We have the process, we have the experience, we have, you know, the portfolio and all this kind of stuff, but yeah, so does everybody else. So how are you communicating? That's the challenge is how are you communicating your unique value when you're up against 15 other agencies that can do the same thing? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you've had, you've, uh, you, you, you mentioned you've done over 600 to 700 <laughs> RFPs. Over your career, which is a, a lot, a lot. <laughs> which uh, I can't even spell <laughs> RFP. So I mean, that's tells you how many I've actually done. Um, I'm sure you've had tons and tons of mistakes over over the period of time. Can you uh, would you mind sharing with us a few of those and and then how, how how you can avoid um, those mistakes going forward and oh, what you've learned wow. from those, I guess. Because I'm sure you've had that ideal client, right? That you thought, oh, we're going to get it for sure, and then all of a sudden you didn't get it and. And you find out, well, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, well, I mean, I can tell, I can tell some, some war stories for sure, but you know, I think that, um, where people mess up across the board and let me mm -hmm. back up and say that the challenges that I think everyone's up against, regardless of your industry, whether you're a digital agency or something else, regardless of what industry you're responding to, everyone has the same set of challenges, which is not enough time to respond, not enough bodies to throw at the response to make it really thoughtful, sometimes not enough intel to really craft a response like that is empathetic to the actual needs of the client. So I just want to level set that like everyone has those problems. So if you're thinking like, yeah, yeah. but I can't because whatever, well, you're super not alone. But the mistakes that people make are more mistakes, I think, of just like process and not thinking it through, right? So understanding that, yes, you have limited time, that doesn't mean just throw all your boilerplate in there and change some names and RFP numbers on the cover letter, like, whoever receives that is going to be able to see right through it. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the main mistake is not having not having a good strategy when you get that RFP in, knowing exactly why you were responding to it, what value you're bringing. So, you know, it's, it's not like missing periods or bug dust or, you know, oh, mm -hmm. whoops, we gave the wrong phone number for a reference. Right. It's the lack of time and thought that goes through it from the minute you get that RFP in your inbox to the minute it hits the client's desk. Sounds like it's pretty personalized to the client then, right? I mean, I think that's kind of what you're getting at. How would you, how would you uh, find out more about that client to make so it personalized? I, and this isn't always, um, not always possible, but to, if, if you're able mm -hmm. to disrupt a little bit and get on the phone with them and ask them really what they need, they're going to tell you a lot more than what's in that RFP document because that RFP document, we've all seen mm. them like, Oh, this looks like it was copied and pasted from something else. Like, yeah, it probably was because they're right. busy too. You know, they just need to get this stuff done. So having, being able to have that conversation with them, if you're able to super key, um, make sure you're asking your questions during the request, the question review period and ask really smart questions not just like, well, this is our list that we usually ask to make sure that we're going to be compliant. Um, if you're not able to have those conversations, do as much of your homework online as you can. Stalk them on LinkedIn. Find out who, is, I'm serious, <laughs> find out who is going to be reviewing it. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I mean, think about it. It's a proposal. 
you are you are asking someone to spend a significant amount of money and time with you and the result is really critical so approach it with that mindset find out as much as you can about these people and what matters to them right so not just necessarily what matters to their organization because that's pretty obvious on the surface but you know is this uh is the marketing manager new in their role is this their opportunity to prove themselves your job in the RFP is to assure them that you're going to make them look good. Is this um, someone who's on their way out and this is their last big project before they retire? You're, we're going to send you off in a blaze of glory, my friend. Like this is going to be your legacy and you're going to love it. So as much as you're able to kind of get a sense for who the individuals are, the better you are kind of mm -hmm. setting up for yourself because when you do your kickoff at the beginning, you're like, okay, well, we know that these six people are going to be reviewing this. How are we going to take care of each one of them throughout the rest of this proposal? What matters most to them? And make sure that those things kind of come out um, throughout the entire document as each individual is able to read through it. Now, sometimes you have situations where you have like 20 something people on a review committee can you do that for all 20 something people? Probably not. Also, if you've got that many people on a review committee, good luck. So. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, I, want, I wanted to circle back real quick to something you mentioned earlier, because I thought this was very interesting. Um, you mentioned that recently you've been asked to bid and have been competing against incumbent agencies who've had long-standing relationships with clients and have in certain cases sound like you were you won the contract and have beaten out those incumbents um if we learn anything from from work it's it's that workplace inertia is real like yeah. people don't like change and so sometimes you know getting a new project taking out an incumbent is a very scary idea to you know, especially some of our smaller agencies who maybe don't have as many resources to throw at a proposal. What are some things that you've learned in those processes that that might be helpful for for, for positioning to overthrow an incumbent? You mean? Oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or or bidding on a new project that they maybe don't have a lot of history with, but know it's like right up their alley and they do great at Ooh. it. Ooh, yeah. I think you know if you if. Again, this can be a little bit tricky and it's not always easy to find, but if you if you can figure out who your competition is, especially who the incumbent is, because like to your point, like inertia is real. People get stale or there's or there's something going on in that relationship that's no longer working or maybe it's someone else has come in and they just want to make a change. Find out what it is about your competition that you can differentiate against. And that's not necessarily to say like, you know, hold up a negative mirror against them to say, we're better than that. It's we're different. Here is mm -hmm. why our differences are going to matter to you. You know, um, that can be like, for example, uh, if we're, you know, in the healthcare space and there's a lot of chatter about, it's not, it's not a hospital anymore. It's not a healthcare system. It's a suite of services. These are these are consumers that are coming to interact with the healthcare system. And you're now competing against not the other hospitals in your area, but CVS and Walmart and Amazon. How are how are we going to create a digital experience that's like that? And understand what that approach is going to be and um, and and what that experience is going to be like, because chances are the folks that have been in there for a long time are, it could be resting on their laurels or just say, you know, we have the relationship. They love us. We've been in for seven years. Well, we're in an industry where stuff changes overnight. So. Well, and, and just like a lot of industries too, you know, if you're looking at ROIs on, on investments and things like that, you know, seven mm -hmm. years is a long time. And if you're not constantly, you know, continuing to deliver on your brand promise, you know, another thing for clients to remember too, is maybe you're yeah. the incumbent mm -hmm. and, and this is something to be, you know, be aware of what other people are, are possibly doing yeah. to try to show their value. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yours. if you, if you have those relationships, you also probably have a target on your back. And, um, it, you know, this is just a strain from the RFP and like into the long term relationship. But, you know, if you're a client, you I think you want industry partners, you want agency partners that are going to continue to push you. 
Um, you don't want someone to show up. I like to say show up and throw up. Like, look how great we are. Uh, <laughs> us just because we're awesome. No, you, you want someone mm-hmm. that's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable and, and push on you. And, and mm-hmm. frankly, I mean, I think uh, as agencies, we should want that too. We want to have that little bit of, of friction and push in the relationship. And so, you know, how can you demonstrate that from the outset of the relationship before you even have a contract? How can you demonstrate what you're going to do for them, not in the deliverable that gets produced in the end of whatever, a year or 18 months, but over the course of that relationship, because that's really what matters. It's not necessarily the bunch of pickles that we all produce at the end. It's that relationship and how are we going to make each other better? Well, I'm sure Jody, you can speak to this too. This is this goes so much further than beyond just digital agencies. I'm sure we see that with our consulting from time to time, where mm-hmm. we build up a nice rapport, a nice relationship with with our clients, and sometimes it helps to have another advisor just kind of come in and say, "Hey, what am I missing here? What's what's gotten stale in my consulting? Am I missing anything?" So, Jody, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you handle this from from the accounting side of the world and dealing with these relationships. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's super important that we have, you know, we, we understand that keeping a, uh, a team, a, a, a client happy and satisfied, keeping clients a lot cheaper than actually going out and uh, doing an RFP and, and really bidding for it. Because RFPs oh, cost yeah. a ton of money and, and a ton of money yeah. in regarding time. Because you, I can't imagine the hours and hours and hours you get put to, you know, putting together a really solid RFP uh, for a client. So you know, I, I think the key there is, you know, trying to retain clients is, is going to be super important or maybe as important, if not more important than than, than going out and attracting new clients. And so I think that's a, an important thing, important concept that you brought up, Joey. I think, you know, constantly reevaluating, uh, sending out uh, constant notices to clients, how you doing, giving them calls and, and just kind of getting good feedback on how we can improve things. Uh, bringing in you know other people to kind of oversee things and just kind of you know get a second eye on things just to make sure that you know you're, you're in the weeds so so often that a lot of times you can't really see what's actually happening and I think that's important uh, going through which kind of piggybacks off of my, my 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 question I've got for you Lauren is that you know because of the cost involved in it you know you, you've got to be I I would think you'd have to be pretty selective on what RFPs you actually respond to. Um, what are some of like those criteria that you use to say, you know, hey, this is an RFP that I think that we can win, or I think this is a this is a perfect fit for that's our. A, for our that's a that's a great question, um, and I, we don't do this now because we kind of have this dialed in so well right now with our positioning in the healthcare market. But um, in other mm-hmm. in other companies where I've worked, where we had like five or six markets and projects of very wildly varying size. Um, it really helps to have a like a no go, a go no go sheet or a or, or process where you are mm-hmm. scoring each criteria. And those criteria are going to vary. Um, but a lot of times it's first of all, can we be profitable? And if we can't, is this a project that is like a foot in the door that we're willing to invest on because we see the value, the long term value with this client? So that's a really, really important conversation to have off the top. After that, it's can we meet all of their criteria? Um, so, you know, if you've got an RFP where they're saying, well, we we want to see five projects that you've done for a consumer brand and you've got one, you either need to be real honest with yourselves mm-hmm. about like, this is a gap and figure out how you're going to close it rhetorically. Because on their little check sheet, it's like, well, they only have one retail experience, you know, and we asked for five. So it's having those hard conversations um, about that, about actual compliance. Um, Do you have the resources to compete to actually complete their job by the time that they are looking for you to complete it? We all know that client timelines can sometimes be a little unrealistic. Um, And then how are you going to address that? Uh, if, if that's going to be a struggle for you. So I think, you know, like it's whatever makes the most sense for your agency, but those are like the, 
I would say the biggest ones is, can you make money? If not, why is that okay? Can you be compliant to what they're looking for? Can you complete the work? Um, and then all of the rest is, is I think, just kind of dependent upon your, your market position and, 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 and what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that because I, I think a lot of the things with client retention are, is basically coming in with the right, uh, with the right frame of mind and the right yeah. client to begin with. Uh, it, it's very huge. You know, kind of, kind of on the next stage of that journey there. So you've got the RFP, you, you won the client. You know, the, one of the biggest things that we see is there's a disconnect from what the project management team looks at it and thinks, oh, this is the, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And here's what we as business development or salespeople in the RFP say, you know, hey, here's what we promised. How, how do you bridge that gap between uh, the team performing the work and uh, you're out there? Uh, That's a good question. Um, I, I think the best way to bridge that gap is to have your account directors, account managers, and project managers involved, involved while you are crafting your RFP response. Um, and that's for two reasons. One, they're going to keep you honest. Um, because you know, when you're, when you've got that project on a hook, that's like, oh man, this could be a game changer. Or like, oh dude, I really want to get this logo for the website. Like it is so easy for us extroverted business development people to just get super excited. So like, Get those folks involved early to keep you honest about what's feasible <laughs> and realistic. Um, and, mm -hmm. and two, that gives them all of that context at the top so that when you go to the pitch, they're ready. You're not educating them right before the pitch and you're not educating them at, at handoff. Mm -hmm. So get them involved, even if it's just like, hey, guys, I just need you to look over this, you know, budget spreadsheet or whatever, get them involved early, get them already in that context. So that handoff is, is much smoother. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm curious about too, kind of along the same lines and Jody and I are accountants, so we can't help this. But when I think of this process, I'm like, okay, this is all great. But what sort of infrastructure have you put in place to measure your success in these RFPs in terms of like, do you track how many you send out versus what types of proposal, you know, how your response is from the, from the client on that? And, and what sort of tracking do you do to yeah improve? um so we we track all of our sales we use hubspot it's a great tool um and we have it set mm -hmm. up to where okay. you know we know if we send in an rfp or if it was just an sow and then you know whether we win or lose always ask for a debrief why did you pick us why did you not pick us and then create mm -hmm. some sort of notes document on that and share with the team, make sure that anyone who touched that RFP knows why it won or why it lost. Um, that's going to help with transparency. And it's going to, man, I tell you what, when you get that, that loss feedback, it lodges in your brain and it, it can become mm -hmm. a hindrance, right? You can be like, oh, I don't want to trip over that rock again. So then everything becomes a rock. No, that was a rock for that one client. You, you might not trip over it with this other one. Um, but just continuing to, mm -hmm. to understand where your weaknesses lie, document them, figure out, all right, how are we going to overcome this in the next round or the next, the next time this comes up? Or like I was saying earlier, do we know that that's a big enough gap that we are not going to be able to overcome it? Let's not spend the... Um, to your point, Jody, like the, mm -hmm. it's expensive. I mean, these can cost twenty dollars to $80,000 to respond to. Is it worth that if you know that you have a oh, yeah. gap? Like, you know, save yourself the heartache and the, and the expense. Um, so, so yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a CRM, if you have a sales process, um, just documenting it in there and, and making sure that the team knows because, um, because they'll they'll remember those things too when they approach the next opportunity. They'll remember. Yeah, when it, when it comes to when 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 losing, well, winning the deal, I guess there's winning the deal and losing the deal, right? And so, you, so with winning the deal, do you do you kind of circle back and ask them why we want it? I always recommend that. Or do you just? I always recommend that. that. And, and okay. I think, yeah, and, yeah. And some people can be really shy about that, 
right? Because it's it kind of feels like, well, they they you know they picked us. We shouldn't ask like, well, why did you ask for a second day? Um, you know, it seems like kind of a weird thing to ask, but like we you sort of need to know because that's what's going to make you successful when you are in are you when you're in the weeds. Like this is why they loved us. Let's make sure that they keep loving us for these reasons and find new reasons to love us. Um, so that doesn't always happen because it is a little bit of an awkward question. I don't know why it's more awkward than why did you not pick us? Um, that seems like the harder question mm-hmm. to ask. Um, but yeah, I would always recommend yeah, yeah. ask ask why. And then because you're going to be doing that, like once you have them kind of in your cycle and you're you're working with them and everything, you're going to be sending out client surveys. You're going to ask them anyway. Like just go ahead and get the practice of asking. Yeah, because I, I think I think a lot of times it's, it's kind of funny, but I, I I would hope that all onboarding teams, no matter if it's in accounting or creative agencies or law or whatever, ask that simple question. And, and the reason why that question is so important is because we all have a preconceived mm-hmm. idea in our head why somebody picked us. No, that doesn't mean we're right. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're even close to being right. It could we we could be thinking, oh, because we were the best price option because we had the the, the most talent in our, in our pool or we had whatever. And then you ask him, it's like, no, cause you guys are right down the street. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that exactly. wasn't even, <laughs> that wasn't exactly. even and, and you mentioned price. <laughs> like what if that's the reason, what's your response then? Oh no, maybe we need to revisit our rates. You know, like you need to know mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> because it might, it might sound like, yeah, that's this exactly is a great right. reason, but it might actually be like, Oh no, we need to do some reflection on this because that, that might not be to our advantage long term. Yeah, you know, and, and plus, if it, if it is the fact that hey, you're down the street, well, the reason, well, that's the reason why they hired you. So you may want to think about that during the process that maybe they need some one-on-one attention face to face, or that you may be thinking that you're completely virtual. Or if it is price, you know, yeah, that that, that could be a problem yeah. long term, <laughs> you know, for us as as a as a firm, but there's a lot of different reasons and you want to make sure that, Hey, that you're hitting those reasons that they hired you during that whole process so that you, 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 uh, meet their expectations. Right. Or exactly. Expectations. It's a, it's a great way to benchmark right off the top for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. Good point. Well, Jody, I think it's it's about that time in the show where we stop talking about the fun stuff and ask the really <laughs> oh, interesting excited. questions right, here. Right, right. Oh, here we go, <laughs> Lauren. I'm, it's it's the summertime, and you know, since you know we're all in the remote world, we think about travel a lot in these things. And I'm in, I'm intrigued by the map that's behind you of South America. I knew so, you're going that way. I knew you're going. There. I, yeah, I, you know, it's it's predictable, but you know, you can rely on it like a Swiss clock. You know, just every time. <laughs> So here's here's a question for you that I, I you might have an answer for you might not. So if I need to go first while y'all are figuring out, because I know my answer. Thinking of South America and thinking of vacations, is there a place that you've always wanted to go that's on your bucket list that you haven't done yet? Yes, um, and I'm Ooh. not sure. We're hoping this is going to happen in the next couple of years, but Argentina is our next big trip. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a, a little. Side note, so this map was given to me by my cousin right after my husband and I got married. It just happened to be this is the only like wall in my house big enough to support it. Um, but we, it, she gave it to us because we spent our honeymoon in Ecuador. And when we did that, we were like, oh, this is such an easy, like it's, you know, you don't lose any time, uh, time zone situation. So, uh, so we've been staring at this map for uh, well over a decade and uh, Argentina is next, hopefully. Well, I just, I just had a, a, one of my, my clients just got back from Buenos Aires and said it was an absolute wonderful place. Really loved it. Oh man, how cool. That's a good one to be on the list. How about you? No, I, I a hundred percent agree on that one because I, I met a metal gentleman that's actually down, lives in South America. Uh, lives in Kuwait. He's from Canada, but lives in South America and has been down there for uh, a couple of years now and, and just, uh, loves it. Um, he's like, you know, we, 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 it, it's, it's a must place. Come visit anytime you want. You know, this is the, he, he, I, he would never come back uh, to North America at all. He, I, there, there's no way I, he's lived all over the place and South America is definitely uh, where he, uh, he's going to be living for a long time. The, the, uh, the place that I would like to go to, I've heard a lot about is uh, Iceland. Um, 
uh, kind of uh, maybe maybe people are thinking, well, why Iceland? And it's like, well, it sounds like you know it, it's you know you got glaciers, you got volcanoes, you got all these really cool things that you really don't see on a day to day basis. And I, I think it would be it'd be neat to spend you know maybe a week, week and a half, two weeks in Iceland, just kind of you know you know doing the hiking, you know doing the trails, and really kind of just seeing uh, what nature is all about, and then possibly leaving the phone maybe in, in the uh, airplane on accident when you get dropped off so that <laughs> so it doesn't take you back to the the world of uh oh yeah I, I fully there. support but, uh, Iceland your plane on the, I is, mean, is a place that I've uh, I've always wanted to always wanted to kind of just venture yeah. out and see what it's all about yeah what well, Jody kind of he, he tangentially stole mine so living living in the desert i am i am fascinated with snow it's my favorite thing jody's over here rolling his eyes like we get plenty of that in indy don't worry about it it's fine you don't need it well we do need it here in the desert we love it so one of the things that my <laughs> wife and i really want to do at some point is we we need to see the northern lights so whether that's iceland whether that's up in in like norway or sweden or I've, you know, I've had relatives have gone to Denali in Alaska and have seen the Northern Lights up there, wherever we can get to see those, that's, that's where we need to be. So that's, that's on our list. I don't know how I'm going to get there because I'm not the best flyer. Um, it's a long drive to Alaska, but we can do it. Yeah. You know, Alaska is yeah. pretty nice. I mean, I, I, I've not been there, but you know, that's another one that uh, I, I would love to go. I would love to go there. Um, that uh, it, it, very similar to Iceland, I think, in in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of people go to Alaska and have, just have a great time. And, and yeah, you can can drive to Alaska. Just so that you know, I've got a a, a former client that uh, rode a motorcycle all the way to Alaska. Oh. Yeah, wow, with, with a bunch that's of folks. a trip. Yeah, there's like ten of. Oh, that. that's a story. Yeah, I went on a motorcycle ride all the way from Indiana to Alaska. <laughs> It can be done. To, I I think you should, yeah, map that. I mean, and think about it. All the stuff that you'll see on the way that you would just, you know, you miss from from the sky. So it's a mm -hmm. it's an opportunity. It's a feature, not a bug. Exactly. Exactly. You just got you just got to build that into the road trip, right? You know, say, hey, we're going to stop here, 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 and here, and yeah. and then you're there. Make make the journey part of the part of the thing. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for, for joining us real quick for, for our audience is where's the best way to find information on you and, and reason one, if they have any questions or would like to reach out. To oh, sure. Absolutely. I'm happy to share that. Um, you can go to our website, uh, reason one, .com, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Lauren miners out there, so it should be pretty easy to find. Uh, it's nice having a unique name. Um, yeah, and uh, I'd be happy to to chat all things RFP or healthcare digital with anyone who's curious. Well, thank you so much. It's been it's been a great uh, great time chatting with you. I'm looking forward to the next one. And uh, sure. thank you, you so much. Time. This has been lovely. Appreciate it. Enjoy this podcast. Visit our website, summitcpa.net, to get more tips and strategy for achieving business success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.